probably everybody else has too. Uh, John and Martha King, co-chairman of King Schools, have uh, revolutionized the way the pilots learn through intimate video instruction and interactive online courses and are regarded by pilots throughout the world as their professional aviation mentors. I agree with that. For decades, they've been taught nearly half of them. Nearly half of the pilots learning to fly in the United States. Each of them has taught more pilots than any other instructor in the history of aviation. The Kings continue to be avid the students of aviation and were the first couple to both hold every category and class of FAA rating on their pilot and instructor certificates. Martha is the first and only one to achieve this. They've circled the globe in their Falcon 10 and piloted aircraft in every continent in the world except Antarctica. Why not? Too cold? <laughs> it was hard to get. It was hard not to come back people. from Antarctica. <laughs> not enough people. Uh, and the environments range from high Arctic to uh, tropical rainforest to remote desert. They pioneered improvements on the risk management practice of pilots and spoke to thousands of pilots worldwide on the subject. The King share a column. Sky Kings and Flying Magazine on real world risk mitigation. Uh, with that said, I want to give both of these folks a certificate of appreciation awarded to John and Martha King in recognition for your support for an air venture event which comes this year. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And now, the King. Well, hello, fellow pilots. In case there's any confusion about this, I'm John King. And I'm Martha King, and we are standing up. <laughs> How many people in here are pilots? Holy mackerel, Martha. I think we're surrounded, surrounded John. Yeah. You know, one of the highest compliments I can pay to someone is to observe they're not normal. <laughs> and folks, you figured it out. You're not normal. And, and the reason I say that is that you have this habit of play. And it's a word Martha and I, we're always making up words for things. So the word play stands for P-L-A-Y. You had a passion, lots of passions generally. That's how you got to be pilots. Uh, you uh, have lots of interests and you're always learning. And then the why is yet again, you just have a habit of having passions, interests and learning. Uh, uh, and so uh, that's play. And, and I think that it makes for extraordinary people. Uh, and one of the things we know about you is that you're hardwired to set out, to complete what you set out to do. And the reason, the reason we say that is that it takes a lot of determination to learn to fly. It takes a lot of effort to learn to fly. And it takes effort over an extended period of time. It takes a willingness to, to, to keep on doing it. That's what passion does for you. Passion makes you try harder and continue longer than, than, than if you didn't have a passion. So uh, you're extraordinary uh, people. You're, you're, you're hardwired, you're, you're goal-oriented. You're hardwired to complete what you set out to do. Uh, to do. And in general, uh, being goal-oriented is a good thing. We're gonna talk about how it might be a risk factor in the inside. You know, uh, probably like a lot of y'all, John and I have always um, uh, owned and flown just a little bit more airplane than we could quite afford. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them are uh, oh, yeah, 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 that situation, John. Yeah, yeah, I think so. yeah. Um, that's what passion will do to you about airplanes. So uh, we, we uh, owned and flew a Cessna 340 twin engine Cessna for 10 years when we were teaching the live two-day ground schools. And we enjoyed it very much. It was a wonderful airplane, pressurized, could fly pretty high. Uh, and it was a, a, a real good traveling machine for us for the ground schools. But you know, after a while, it doesn't matter what you fly, you want something that flies higher, faster, and further. It doesn't matter what you fly. And we got this terrible disease, really bad disease. We got this need to smell jet fuel. It's an expensive and disease. A very expensive disease. So we lost our heads and we went out and we bought an old Citation 500. 
and we call it a citation zero because it was so old they hadn't even started giving numbers like citation one, citation two, and so on to it. So as I say, we called it a citation zero. And a very reliable, wonderful airplane, uh, great to, to transition to from the Cessna 340. It was one of the very first business jets ever built, the one that uh, Cessna, of course, built. Um, it was also one of the slowest business jets <laughs> ever built. And, you know, the, the insults were terrible. <laughs> People would call us a slotation. <laughs> they would call us a crustacean. <laughs> they would call us a mutation. The controllers would call us a frustration. They were always having to move us aside to let a real jet pass. <laughs> How many people in here remember uh, the ads that Beechcraft used to run for the King Air that said it flies at near jet speeds? Remember that? A few of you do. Our citation was the near jet they were talking about. <laughs> and it had an unusual bird strike problem. Anyone know what that bird strike problem was? Got run down from the roof. <laughs> so, Terrible insults. So for over a decade, we endured all of these insults by in this slow jet, and we decided we wanted something faster. So we fell in lust. Um, with the current airplane we have now, an old Falcon 10. And that Falcon 10 is 150 knots faster than that old Citation. Now you can imagine the uh, insurance company had grave <laughs> misgivings about <laughs> the idea of this uh, mom and pop operation flying this hot jet. And so they said, look, John Murphy, in addition to getting type rated in this airplane, we want to make sure you go out and take the full three-week simulator course in this airplane. So we did that. Uh, we went to, uh, uh, come on, it's not flight safety, it's, um, uh, well, it's, it's now sim 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 flight. We went to Simulflight flight in, 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 in Dallas, Texas, and it's just about the hardest we ever worked in our lives. We sweated bullets. Uh, it was just about the hard, our, our right leg shake. It was just about the hardest thing we ever did. Uh, but when we got done, we figured we must have done pretty well because the instructor got us aside. He said, look, John, Martha, uh, you'll never have to, I've got some wonderful news for you in this airplane. I said, oh, that's, why, that's wonderful. What's that? He says, well, you'll never have to worry about a mid-air collision in this airplane. I said, that's wonderful. Why not? He says, you are so far behind this airplane, you won't even be involved. <laughs> <laughs> he says, you're going to come walking up to the crash site. So like, what happened here? <laughs> so we've been flying together now since 1969. I almost hate to say that. Yeah, How many years is that? A long time. Ago. <laughs> a long time. And John has friends who say to him, used to more than they do now, uh, you're lucky that Martha's willing to fly with you. <laughs> and you say to them, lucky? What are you talking about lucky? She wants to fly half the time. It costs twice as much. And she's got an opinion about everything. <laughs> you know, John likes to think that our relationship exemplifies that old story that behind every successful man stands a great woman. You've got that right, Martha. That's exactly how I feel about it. <laughs> He doesn't realize that the real story is in front of every great woman stands some guy without a clue <laughs> who's blocking her view. <laughs> this is how my life goes. <laughs> Well, what we'd like to do today, we've, as I said, we've flown together a lot of years. Um, we've scared ourselves, I'm not going to say how many times. Many. 
<laughs> and, and, and we're gonna talk about some of that today. But what we'd like to do is share with you some risk management tools that we've developed because we scared <laughs> ourselves that hopefully uh, you'll find useful and will help you have fun, stress-free trips and make sure that your passengers will fly with you again. <laughs> what we're going to do right here in this room this afternoon, we're going to reveal the most important consideration in flying and the most feared emergency in all of aviation. You know, in aviation for a long, long time, we've been telling what I call the big lie. And, and the big lie, a big lie, is one that you have told for so long and, and repeated it so many times that you begin to believe it yourself. And the big lie in aviation is the most dangerous part of the trip was the drive to the airport. And that is true if you're going on the airlines. It is not true in general aviation. You are, if on a fatality per mile basis, you're more seven times more likely to be involved in a fatality in a general aviation airplane per mile than you are in a car. It's just how the numbers work out. It's math. Um, you're, you're 49 times more likely to be involved in a fatality in a general aviation airplane per mile than you are on the airlines. Uh, in fact, on a fatalities per mile basis, general aviation airplanes are on a par with motorcycles. Uh, and, and of course, in California, we've got guys lane splitting. It's legal now to do lane splitting. Uh, you're going down a freeway and some guy goes in between the lanes, you think he's going to kill himself. And he probably is. It's on a par with general aviation. Um, so we want to talk about that and what we can do about that in general aviation. Because I think that we in this room all have the tools to change that. So let's talk about how we can change it. And one of the one of the things that, uh, that it's, back when we were traveling around the country doing traveling seminars, we'd return to a city and someone would say, "Hey, did you hear about Bill?" And we said, "No, what happened, Bill?" Well, he got killed in a general aviation accident. We began to realize that uh, this is a risky activity, and people that we cared about were, were getting hurt, killed in general aviation airplanes. We got tired of it. We wanted to do something about it. And finally, we uh, had a guy uh, that was in one of my classes. Uh, he was both an Episcopalian priest and he was a, uh, a physician. He was a radiologist. And he did, he did not play the conventional social rules of a classroom. He'd blurt things out and come in late and want me to repeat. There'd be 100 people in the classroom and he came in late and he wanted me to repeat everything he missed because he came in late. And I, and I told the FAA guy, I said, Dell, I said, um, you got you to talk to Parsons, to Dr. Parsons. I think he's going to kill himself in an airplane. And he says, John, I can't go pick somebody out of your class and give him a lecture just because you say I should. He'll call his congressman. And, and he, says, he says, you talk to him. I said, why? He's not going to listen to me. I'm just a traveling down instructor. So we never did anything. And about two weeks later, the phone rang, and it's Adele Randalls. He's an FA inspector. He says, John, I thought you want to know Dr. Parsons is dead. And he had killed himself on a solo cross country uh, within about two weeks of when I said we should talk to him. And so that, that was a turning point for me, and it made me decide we're, we're going to do something about it. With you, if you can see it coming and, and you think you know what to do, we, we just aren't. Can I am never again going to stand by and let uh, somebody put a guilt trip on me like that because it, it just really just, just clobbered me. And I just, I'm not going to let somebody do that to me again. And then later on, as time went on, we started doing video, people started listening to us, and I, and I decided that. I had the, uh, we had the opportunity to do something about the whole aviation community. And I'm not gonna let the community put a guilt trip on me either. We're gonna do something about it. That's why you're having to put up with us today. And, and so that's how we got here. That's why we're here. Uh, and so go ahead, Martha. Well, part of the problem with the accident rate in general aviation is that the risks are not obvious. They're obvious in th some things. You go mountain climbing, uh, 
uh, pretty into a lot of the risks are pretty intuitive, even though there's a lot of training for it uh, in order to um, to mitigate those. But the risks in flying are sneaky, they're insidious, and they very often catch pilots by surprise. The pilot is, if you will, fat, dumb, and happy because they just don't see it coming. They catch the pilots by surprise. Part of the problem is that the risks in flying are hard to judge. It's hard to judge the probability and it's hard to judge the consequences. And if you talk to risk management uh, experts generally, they will say, if you're looking at a risk where it's hard to judge the probability and the consequences, human beings generally will greatly underestimate the amount of risk that's involved. So, but the plain fact is, the risks in generalization, if left unmanaged, are unacceptable, or just simply flat out unacceptable. To illustrate this, I'm going to ask you a question. And what I want you to do is when you hear this question, if the answer is yes for you, I would like you to put up your hand, leave it up, and look around the room. So here is the question. If the answer is yes for you, please put up your hand. How many people know someone personal who was killed in a general aviation accident? And if you look around the room, uh, it's, it's, it's what, more than half the people in Yeah, the room. I'd say 60, 65 percent. Folks, this is unacceptable. And we're going to do something about it. I would like you to join me in doing something about it. Because, or join us, I should say. Us. Martha's, Martha's only, I want to make it clear right now. Martha's only a little bit better pilot than I am. <laughs> you used to say I was a lot better pilot than you well, were. Well, I've gotten better. <laughs> So, I would like you to join us in our campaign together. I think we can make a difference. We'll talk about it, and let's see if, if you, when we're done, we know what steps we're going to take to make a difference. Part of the problem is, historically, the way that general aviation risk management teaching has been taught and has been practiced has been flawed. And here's the reason that I say it's been flawed. If you look at the accidents in general aviation, about 85% of our accidents are caused one way or another by a failure in risk management. So of course, generally, until very recently, what has our flight training focused on? It's focused on physical skill in manipulating and maneuvering the aircraft. Now, don't get me wrong, the physical skill is an absolute must. We have to have that. What I'm saying is it's not enough because it doesn't address that cause of accidents. When students leave flight training, their accident rate jumps by about 50%. When they're in flight training, the accident rate per 100,000 hours in student training is about 5.8%. For uh, five, excuse me, 5.8 per 100,000 uh, hours. For a new private pilot, it's about 8.5. Now you look at those numbers and you scratch your head and you say, that's weird. You would think the accident rate would be higher dur during uh, initial student instruction because after all, you're starting with someone who wants to learn to fly, who knows nothing about how to use the flight controls in the airplane, nothing about the aerodynamics, nothing about weather and aircraft performance. But apparently what happens is that we flight instructors have done a reasonably good job of exercising risk management over the whole flight instruction process. What we have not historically done a good enough job about is transferring more of our ability to mitigate risks to our learning pilots so that when they get the wet ink on their new certificate, put it in their pocket and go take off on their own, that they have not our level of risk management uh, mitigation. And they're not ready, I mean, they haven't gotten there yet, but more than they have had historically, that we're able to give them more tools, more processes in order to manage the risk. 
Historically, the way risk management has been taught in general aviation is telling stories, passing along rules, and making up sayings. And the sayings are great. There are sayings like, um, the only time you can have too much fuel in an aircraft is when you're what? Uh, when you're fire. on fire. Um, <laughs> the two most useless things in aviation are the what behind you, the runway behind, behind you, and the what above you, sky the sky above, above you. you. Or um, it's a lot better to be down on the ground wishing you were up in the air than being up in the air really wanting to be on the ground right now. <laughs> They're great sayings, they're fabulous. We all know them, they're fantastic sayings. But they're not enough, because they're not a system. They're not comprehensive enough, and they're not proactive enough. You know, the way uh, most of us become experienced <laughs> is the way Martha and I did. You have to go out and get your license and go out and do stuff. And uh, expose yourself to a risk, and then you look back and say, "Well, how'd that work out?" You evaluate the result, <laughs> and uh, and uh, if you don't scare yourself, a lot of us just put that risk in the acceptable category. Uh, and if you do this enough, you become really experienced. But the, you may have just been lucky. So, um, and if on the other hand. Uh, and by the way, the more times you get away with it, the more acceptable it becomes. You think, wow, this is okay, it's not so bad. Um, uh, but th the deal is, if you go out and you scare yourself, you say, man, I'll never do that again. And when you're really experienced, you get a big, long list of things you'll never do again. <laughs> and, and so that's, you get an acceptable, or an experienced pilot has this big, long list of things they'll never do again. And if the pilot doesn't run out of luck, they are what you call an experienced pilot, meaning they didn't run out of luck during that time period. As a community, we're beginning to do better. One of the things that we're doing now is we're teaching using scenario-based training. We're asking instructors to, to put the learning pilot in a scenario and say, here are the things that you're about to do. Here, tell me about the risks there. You were asking them to identify the risks. You tell me how you're gonna mitigate those risks. Well, they're actually teaching for the very first time, teaching pilots about the risks and how they might mitigate them and asking them to demonstrate it. And on the Airman Certification Standards, if we go take a practical test now, for the very first time, we're asking pilots to, uh, to be able to identify and mitigate risks. Previously, we did not ask pilots, we did not teach pilots about it, we did not ask pilots to do it. Hopefully, with the practice uh, uh, habitually uh, thinking about risk, being situationally aware about risk, mitig mitigating risk, that we as a community can get better at risk management. The problem with learning from experience is experience is a hard teacher. She gives the test first and the lesson comes afterwards. And sadly, a lot of times, pilots and their passengers never survive the test in order to learn the lesson. And that's just not acceptable. And John said an experienced pilot gets this real long list of unacceptable risks, but even that doesn't prepare a pilot for an unanticipated risk. They have to get in a more proactive mode rather than reactive mode about risk management. Now, the way Marth and I became, quote, experienced pilots is when we were traveling around the country, we were teaching two-day ground schools. And what we did is we had a, a circuit of cities that we would go to, uh, and we picked our cities from a business case. What we were picking was cities that uh, had lots of flying, but not many services, places like uh, there were remote places where uh, they, the services just weren't going to come to them generally. Places like Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Billings, Montana, Spokane, Washington. 
lots of flying going on in those places, but not many services. So we just started every weekend teaching a two-day ground school. We'd do weekend ground school. We would, we would get a hotel. We would uh, arrange meeting rooms in a hotel. We'd mail out mailers, and pilots would come for about, oh, 300 miles around, and we would teach their ground schools in a weekend. And, and so we did weekend ground schools. Uh, and the way we would do it is that uh, we had a, uh, this time we had an old Cessna 210 with a Ray J turbocharger on it. And we lived in San Diego, California. So we would go out on the Friday before the weekend ground school and fly to the city, get there in the city in the evening. And Saturday and Sunday, we'd teach the weekend ground school. On Monday, the FAA would come and administer the test. We would help them administer the test. And then uh, on Monday afternoon, we would fly back home in San Diego. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we'd do all the things you do when you run a small business. We would arrange the classes, answer the phones, and those kinds of things, do mailers, and those kinds of things. So, so we were getting a lot of flying. And we, we had an accident, and I'm going to tell you about this accident because it changed everything about our attitude about flying, we became much, much more risk aware. You might say that we became born again pilots because it changed everything about our flying. So this one uh, uh, day we took off on a Friday morning, we took off to go fly to uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota from San Diego, California. We headed out northeast, got to the Rocky Mountains, went over across the Rocky Mountains, and went down in the uh, uh, prairie or in the plains on the east side in a town called La Junta, Colorado, uh, and got fuel in La Junta, Colorado, got a weather briefing, uh, took off again, and climbed up to about 11,500 feet, and there was an overcast. We got on top of the overcast, and we said, well, shoot, let's, you know, um, let's just cancel IFR. We'll go VFR on top. So we're flying along 11,500 feet, and we look over and son of a gun, the generator quit working. And we thought, oh, son of a gun, look at that. You know, we're, we're gonna get to uh, Sioux Falls uh, late in the evening. It's gonna be right about sunset. Um, uh, it's gonna be, we, we, we got our weather briefing. We saw the weather was gonna be about a thousand foot ceiling and three miles visibility. So we said, you know, we're going to get there at dark, we have to set up the classroom, we have to uh, get, uh, get uh, all the plotters and computers out and everything all ready to go. Uh, here's what let's do. Let's just shut off everything electrical. You know, what we should have done, of course, is landed and got a generator fixed. We said, well, let's shut off everything electrical and just hold a heading. We're pretty good at hold a heading. We'll fly by dead reckoning. It's only going to be about three more hours. So, so. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're on I to think it. They see it <laughs> so we'll hold the heading and when and we'll time it and hold the heading and when we think we're in the vicinity of Sioux Falls, we'll turn on the electrical system again, call up approach control, get a clearance, get down underneath the overcast, and excuse me. <coughs> and and uh, uh, get the generator fixed while we're teaching our ground school. It sounds like a perfect plan. So we get to the vicinity of Sioux Falls, we say, hold it, we better not start down here because there are real tall antennas in the vicinity of Sioux Falls. So let's turn north and we'll go for it until we think we're about 30 or 40 miles north of Sioux Falls and we'll uh, dead reckon and we get about 30 miles north, we'll butt down and get underneath the overcast, go find an uncontrolled airport underneath the overcast and get, get the airplane fixed. So we enter the clouds, we head north, we think, okay, this is the area. We, at about 10,000 feet, we enter the clouds, and all of a sudden, whack, ice all over the earth. Now, if you're in icing conditions, and you do not have an electrical system, what else do you not have? A de-icing. You don't have pedo heat. So, oh, yeah. so uh, uh, all of a sudden, the airspeed indicator goes 90, 80, 70, 60. And we're like, wow, this airplane's slowing down big time. And you're believing that until it, it, it goes below zero, you know it's not backing up. <laughs> <laughs> so we continue on down. And now I can tell you that we continue until we think we're 100 feet above the ground. 
and never see the ground. <laughs> oh, holy mackerel. You know, we don't know exactly where we are. We don't know the height of the ground. Uh, we don't uh, have a current altimeter we don't have setting. A current altimeter setting. So, holy mackerel, we put the power in, take off, and uh, on our way back up, we climbed on 10,000 feet, above 10,000 feet, we pick up our second load of ice. Now, I can tell you, we get up on top of the clouds. Uh, and two loads of ice on the airplane. And Martha and I have a, a, a strange policy. We have a deal. I fly the airplane one time, she flies it the next time. Uh, and if, uh, if I try and touch the controls when it's her time to fly the airplane, she breaks my arm. <laughs> <laughs> I would have given anything for it have been Martha's turn to fly the airplane. <laughs> I was scared to death. I said, Martha, we are in deep trouble. Do something. <laughs> At one point I said, I got it. Here's what let's do. Let's find another airplane and we'll just follow it to an airport. She says, John, that's not gonna work. And we continue this discussion. And uh, as we continue the discussion, the sun slowly sets below the horizon. <laughs> and Martha says to me, John, would you rather do it now or in the dark? I hate it when she thinks that way. <laughs> so we decide to go back down again. And, and Martha says to me, John, you need to go down. And Martha says, I said to Martha, she said, John, you need to go down. I said, Martha, I don't want to go there. <laughs> you know, we got to where we thought we were within 100 feet above the ground, uh, but we don't know how high the ground is here. We don't know exactly where we are. We, we, uh, we, we don't have a current altimeter set. I said, the way this is going to end is we're going to hit something. And uh, who knows what we're going to hit? We're going to hit an antenna, TV tower, a silo, who knows, a barn, who knows what we're going to hit, but the way this is going to end is we're going to hit something. And she says, let's do it now while it's still light. So we can, so we continue on down. And once again, we're down to where we think we're within 100 feet of the ground. Still don't see the ground. And, and uh, I say to Martha, we got to get, we got to go around. She says, no, John, we can't go around because uh, we, 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 there's nothing up there. We already went up there. There's nothing. We're just going to pick up our fourth load of ice. It does not make any sense. She says, we just got to keep going down. And uh, we finally, I, I see a car on a road with its lights on. I said, that's it. I'm going to land on that road. And Martha says, we can't land on that road. Uh, I said, why can't we land on that road? She says, well, there's power lines on the road. I didn't see the power lines. But I can tell you this. At this point, Martha's really getting on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, that's it, we're gonna just land right here. And I just simply reached over, pulled the throttle back, and we, uh, what was going on at the time, by the way, is they had about 18 inches of snow on the ground, and they had had a, they were in, we were in the middle of a freezing rain ice storm. And, and Good there times. was a crust of ice on top of that snow, about an inch and a half crust of ice. And the, the main wheels touched on that crust of ice, and we went for about 75 feet, made a beautiful touchdown. Uh, <laughs> it was gorgeous. <laughs> went for about 75 feet, and the airplane fell through the ice. And at that point, I began my all-time all -time record short field landing. And the airplane went up over on its nose, and uh, it went up clear up to the spinner, and we thought it was going to go over, but it didn't, and it came back. And uh, this next conversation takes place with Martha's and my heads pressed up against the panel of the aircraft. And Martha says to me, John, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. I hit my nose on the panel of the aircraft, but I'm, I'm okay. She says, I got a bloody nose, but other than that, I'm okay. And I, I, I looked over there and I saw blood all over the front of the panel of the aircraft and there, there was a hole in the windshield of the aircraft. 
And I said to her, uh, what the heck, uh, you got a bloody nose? Your head went through the windshield. She says, no, I'm okay, I got a bloody nose, uh, but I'm okay. And I reached over and I felt her back and there was blood all down her back. And I said, well, you got something going on a lot worse than just hitting your head on the panel of the windshield. Uh, but at this point, you could hear things trickling inside the aircraft and things sizzling on the engine. So I said to her, why don't we carry on the rest of this conversation outside the aircraft? And so um, I uh, um, said to her, I can't get my door open because I can't reach the door handle. Uh, because I've had this, uh, by the way, if you're familiar with it, a Cessna 210, the, uh, the way it works is the baggage is up on a shelf behind the pilots, and the reason it's on a shelf is that the landing gear retracts rearward, so it's kind of elevated to make room for the landing gear retracting. So uh, all of this baggage, we weren't smart enough, of course, to put a net there and tie it down. <laughs> so all of this baggage came forward, and uh, uh, so I said, could you please open your door because I can't get my door open. She says, well, I can't reach my door handle either. And, and so eventually I get my door handle uh, uh, open and I go around in front of the aircraft. Out in front of the aircraft, uh, when I get out there, there was a big, long stream of junk out in front of the aircraft. Tools, wrenches, uh, oil can openers, all out in front of the aircraft. And I thought, I'll be darned. Somebody crashed here before we did. <laughs> and, and then I got around to the right side of the aircraft, opened the door. And at that moment is the moment I, for the first time in my re life, I realized how incredibly dumb an allegedly bright person can be. Because what had happened, we also had a toolkit in the back of that aircraft. And that toolkit had come uh, forward beat Martha about the head and shoulders, and gone out through the windshield, and that was our, the contents of our toolkit out in front of the aircraft. And uh, our headliner was smeared with blood, the side panels were smeared with blood. Every inch inside that aircraft was splattered with Martha's blood. And I thought to myself, you idiot, you absolute idiot. How dare you take a, such a terrible risk with the most precious thing in the world to you. Right. And <clears throat> so, of course, when we <clears throat> called the insurance company, the very first thing they did is take the wings off this aircraft, put it up on a truck, take it to an airport, and the very first thing they checked when they got it inside the hangar is, what was wrong with the generator? And the only thing that was wrong with the generator is that a single wire had become detached. And all we would have had to have done was reattach that single wire and we'd have been on our way. Because we didn't want to take the time to reattach that single wire, we put everything in our lives at risk. But we did become born again pilots because we did change everything about our flying from that moment on. Now this 210 was our airplane and we were flying it a lot back and forth to the classes. Um, and John did make a beautiful touchdown on that landing. Uh, skill wasn't the problem. Had nothing, physical skill with the aircraft had nothing to do with that accident. The problem was risk management, as in a total lack of risk management. Because of that accident and, and some other incidents that happened, some of which we're going to talk about here today, but um, some of which I think we ought not to, John, because we are in the FAA building. <laughs> As John says, we, we changed how we fly, how we manage our flights, and we developed some rich management tools that we'd like to share now with you. What we need to do as pilots is conduct active, proactive risk surveillance to look for risk the same way a mechanic looks for defects during an annual. If you have an airplane, annual time comes up, you take it to the mechanic, you may even fly it to another airport for the annual to take place. <clears throat> you may have a small list of squawks, 
but generally as far as you're concerned it's in you know fine shape it just needs to have this paperwork thing done and, and the mechanic look it over as soon as the mechanic gets it they're going to pull out a checklist and they're going to start surveilling that aircraft looking for things that could be a problem over the next 12 months if they're not adequately mitigated not adequately addressed now and that's the kind of thing that we need to do when we think about our flights and during our flights. So before takeoff, the tool that we use is pave your way to a safe flight. Pave is a way proactively before the flight, during the planning stages of looking at the flight, the risks of the flight, and putting them into these four different categories to help us figure out to assess the, the severity, the significance of them. The P for pilot, the A for aircraft, the V for environment or environment. Sorry folks, we made this up. A little tortured, <laughs> but we gotta have an acronym, and you know we do. And the E for external and internal pressures. So what you do is you look at that flight and you think about, you know, what could go wrong? What could be the risks on this related to the pilot, related to the aircraft and so on, and then think about how are we going to mitigate them. And we're talking about mitigation, not denial. We're not talking about a no go, uh, a go, no go decision. We're talking about how can we do this flight with less risk and more comfort. So when you're talking about the pilot, you're asking, am I, as the pilot, ready to do this flight? Am I, uh, am I, do I have the skills I need? Do I have the training? Do I have the background? And um, the other thing you can do is, you, the, the FAA likes to use this, uh, we were talking about the physical condition of the pilot, you use the I'm safe checklist. Have I had any illness? Any, any, have I taken a medication that could be a problem? I under, am I under stress? Is alcohol gonna be a problem? Um, uh, uh, are fatigue and food going to be issues. A lot of people will work all day and then late in the evening decide, without having dinner, decide they're going to go on a trip and go somewhere. And they're leaving fatigued and hungry. That's not probably a good way to do it. And finally, is emotion going to affect my capability to manage this flight? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm having an analogy, I believe. <coughs> and I apologize to you. And, uh, and so if you're mad at the world, probably flying an airplane is not the way to work it out. So emotions are not a good thing when it affects your, affects your judgment. So you go through the IMC checklist. So on the aircraft, you say, is this the right aircraft? Will it carry the load that I'm asking you to do? Will it carry the distance? Is it properly equipped? Back on the pilot, are the, is the pilot inspirated? If it's a nighttime trip, are they ready to fly at night? Is the airplane properly equipped to fly at night? And for uh, every aircraft and every trip, a part of that aircraft is its ability to handle density altitude. And uh, uh, Martha and I one time learned about density altitude, I think on June 26, what are we gonna say, 1974. Uh, we had just gotten a, uh, a Cherokee 140, it was what they called a two plus two. And that is that it could, it could, you could snap in a couple seats in back and it could hold four people, uh, but they didn't want you to think of it as a four place airplane. So they called it a two plus two. And the idea was you could either carry some luggage in back or, or put people in the back, but they didn't want you to think of it as a four place airplane. Of course, Martha and I thought it was a four place yes, airplane. Sir. So we wanted to go see, we lived in San Diego, California. We wanted to go see Death Valley, California. We've never been to Death Valley, California. They had the program Death Valley Days going on. It was an exciting place. And so we thought we're gonna to go to Death Valley. We're gonna take another couple with us. So we took another couple up there and we headed up towards Death Valley one hot afternoon in, on July 26. Uh, and uh, on the way up, we had this brilliant thought that had never occurred to me. Hold it, Death Valley is famous for being in a remote place. What if they don't have any fuel there? Will we have enough fuel to go somewhere else? We decide the smart thing to do is land and get some fuel on the way up. 
So on the east side of the Sierras, down in the desert down there, is, is uh, uh, the Owens Valley. And the Owens Valley is at about 4,000 feet uh, altitude, but boy, it really gets hot there. It's, uh, it's the desert for sure. And so we landed in an airport called Lone Pine in Owens Valley and uh, with the idea to get gas and uh, uh, taxied in and we're like, boy, is it really hot here. And we taxied up to the fuel pumps this old conjurer came walking out, probably quite a bit younger than I am now. Uh, <laughs> and as he slowly walked towards the pumps, I cupped my hands and hollered at him and said, fill her up. And he stopped and he took a long, slow look at me and he said, you mean just fill it up to the tabs there, don't you, sir? And I said to him, did I stutter? I said, fill it up. And he goes, okay. <laughs> so while we go in, go to the bathroom, uh, get something to drink, he begins to fill the airplane completely up to the taps. And so all the way up. All the way up. Uh, to the, I, I'm sorry, all the way, not to the taps, all the way up. Oh, excuse me. Thank you very much. And, and, and he fills the airplane all the way up. And so uh, we come out, we're ready to go, we pay the bill, and we get ready for a takeoff. Now you should know you're doing something wrong when you get ready for a takeoff and it draws a crowd. <laughs> we loaded all four people into that chock full airplane, taxied out to the end of the runway, put the throttle forward, and the wheel just very slowly started rolling. We went the whole length of the runway. And when we got to the far end, I rotated because it seemed to be the thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> that airplane just staggered off the <laughs> runway and so helped me, we flew for five miles with the stall warning light blinking around, <laughs> around trees. Oh my God. As we got the airplane finally able to climb away, huh. I looked back to see how our passengers were doing. <laughs> <laughs> All I could see was four silver dollars. <laughs> that couple never did fly with us. <laughs> but on that afternoon, July 26, 1974, in Lone Pine, California, for the first time in my life, I began to understand the concept of dense geology. Now the V in the PAVE uh, acronym stands for the environment. What environment are you operating in? Is it going to be complex airspace? And if so, do you, do you have the recency with it, the comfort level with it to handle it? Are you going to be flying um, IFR? Are you going to be flying over uh, rough terrain, the mountains, desert areas? Are you going to be flying over water? Over water at night can be really, really black. You, you know, I mean, you've got the lakes here. Uh, it, it, it's IFR flying even if there's not a cloud in the sky. Um, what kind of weather are you going to be going in? One of the problems on our flight in the 210 is that although we landed in La Junta and got a weather update and actually identified an area of weather with about a 5,000 foot ceiling and five miles visibility that could have been a potential escape hatch for us, if you will, a bailout place, we didn't write it down and we couldn't remember where it was. You know, when you think you're about to die, your IQ goes to negative numbers. <laughs> so these days, we make sure that we've got some way to remember and know uh, what the weather around us is going to be. Look at the big picture, not just our destination airport. Um, the ADSBN is fabulous with the ability to get weather on a tablet, so you're not even dependent on the avionics in the airplane. Um, there's a lot more tools to work with to have good situational awareness than we had at the time. 
Handheld um, radios now, just so many things that we right, now. Right, that even cell phones that, that you can hook up and, and make calls from the airplane. Yeah, the, the technology would do everything except raise our IQs. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. And part of the um, environment equation is, are you flying at daytime or are you flying at night? Only about 10% of general aviation flying takes place at night, but about 50% of our accidents do. Oh, I believe that. The aerodynamics don't change, but you can't see. Particularly, you can't see the mountains out there or the radio towers sticking up. Yeah. It's just you can't a lot. See up from down, really. Yeah, you, and then sometimes, depending on how your airplane's equipped, you can't see adequately the instruments inside the airplane. The E in PAVE stands for the external and internal pressures. And what we're talking about at this stage when we're, when we're planning a flight is, what's making you make this trip? Is it an important business trip? Is it a vacation? You've promised the family and you've got big deposits down on the hotel and uh, maybe ski tickets, whatever it may be. Um, is it a big meeting, a business meeting that you're going to and you, you really have to be there? It's potential for a big customer. These are pressures that tend to make us ignore all of the other aspects of the paved checklist. Issues that might be there with the pilot or the aircraft or the environment we're gonna operate in. We get enough external and internal pressure on us. I say internal because as John said, we're goal-oriented people. We tend to ignore all the other risks and just say, I'm focused. I can do this. This is why I got my pilot's license. I could get there. Even the airlines cancel flights sometimes, and we need to as well. So what do you do about this during the pre-flight stage? You think about what the weather is coming up, looking at it long range. You think about the range of the aircraft. Are you gonna be okay as far as the fuel's concerned? Um, do you need an extra fuel stop? Do you need to go a day early just to make sure you're gonna be okay? Do you need to have an alternate means of transportation available? When we're going somewhere, we try very hard to not have people meet us at the airport because that puts pressure on to not stop and, and get fuel if you think you need to or not make a big diversion that adds a lot of time onto the trip, even if the weather says, yeah, you know, you really ought to uh, go a, a longer route around. Um, and if we, they still insist on meeting us, we get a cell phone. Things are much easier these days with people having cell phone number and we get their cell phone number so that if we have to make a stop for any reason, we just simply because we need to go to the bathroom or whatever, uh, we can call them on the cell phone and say, okay, uh, we're gonna be there, but we're gonna be a little bit late. If we're gonna just go out and try and get a $100 hamburger, and just a fun trip, we load a suitcase in the aircraft, an overnight bag, so that uh, if we have any kind of problem at all, it's no big deal to check into a hotel, have a nice evening, have a nice dinner, and then worry about the problem the next morning. So we try and set up strategies and there's so many more things that are available, cell phones and all of that, to take the pressure off of us. Because the biggest thing that goes wrong with pilots is we continue when we shouldn't. We, sh we keep on going when we really ought to stop. And it's what's going on in between our ears that causes us to, to do that. So what we need to do is work up strategies for whenever there is something going on that makes us want to continue that we work up strategies to manage these external pressures. Uh, so, um, so we want to make sure we don't let those external pressures have us ignore the risks that we have been seeing, uh, it, it, that we've been assessing in that flight. Now that's, that's fine when you're planning the trip, but what about once you get airborne, once you take off? At that point, you can use what we call the sea care checklist to manage the risk. What happens, the sea care checklist stands for the changes that are happening and the consequences, the alternatives, reality, and then the external pressures. And 
what we want to do it, with a C-Care checklist is, is it's our risk management scan. So the focus is always on control of the aircraft, but from there we focus, uh, we uh, spoke out, if you will, and we think about what are the consequences of the changes that are happening, uh, what are the alternatives that remain, and what do we need to do to get more, uh, what's the reality we're dealing with, and are external pressures making me do something that I really shouldn't be doing? You know, uh, we plan uh, pay before we got going, but as soon as you take off, all of the things that we plan start changing because flying is dynamic. It's flying an aircraft over changing terrain, an aircraft that's burning fuel and getting lower on fuel with a pilot that's getting more fatigue. All of this, as soon as you get airborne, you're flying in a changing environment and even the external pressures on you change when you get airborne. It's much harder to give up on a goal the closer you get to reaching that goal. And so when you're going to a destination, you're close to that destination, very hard to make yourself land for fuel uh, because you'll, you'll, you'll look at those gauges and you say, they look fine to me. Uh, so it's because you're hardwired to complete what you set out to do because you're goal-oriented people, wonderful thing in most of life. But because you're goal-oriented, it's very hard to get yourself to give up on a goal. So what you need to do is you get airborne, all of this starts changing. Think about the consequences of the change. Let me give you an example of how we might work on this and think about it. Let's assume you get airborne and you look at your ground speed and you're like, son of a gun, look at that. I'm about 20 knots slower than I thought I was going to be. Now, if you're about 20 knots slower than you thought you were going to be, what, what's likely the problem? The wind. The wind is different than you thought it was going to be. Now let's think through the consequences of that. First of all, you're 20 knots slower, that means you're going to get there later, lower on fuel, more fatigue, and you're going to feel anxious because you had a commitment, a reason you were going to get there under more pressure. So your external pressures got greater. Uh, and, and so all of these things happen. But now let's think about this. That's the first level, all those uh, changes, the first level, the first level of consequences. The next level of consequences gets a little more complicated. Uh, now, um, the wind is different than you thought it was going to be. The wind reflects the pressure patterns in fronts. And so as it works out, the pressure patterns and fronts are in different positions than you thought they were going to be. And the weather is going to be different than you thought it was going to be. And as luck would ha have it, probably worse. <laughs> so now you're going to land lower on fuel, more fatigue, later under pressure, in worse weather. So when you took off, you had a big circle of alternatives. The most important consideration of all in flying is to always have alternatives. And when you took off, you had a big circle of alternatives. And as you flow, fly along, the, your circle of alternatives gets smaller and smaller until when you get to your destination, your circle of alternatives is only equal to your uh, reserve fuel in all directions. Well, as you get into this situation and think about all these things that are changes and the consequences of all those changes, it becomes a no-brainer to stop and land and re-expand the circle of alternatives into a big, huge circle of alternatives again. So, we're going through the care checklist. We're thinking about the consequences. We're thinking about the alternatives. And the R says, deal with things as they are not just deal with reality as they really are, not just as you plan them to be. So, uh, uh, you, uh, uh, we haven't done the deal about fuel gauges. When do we do that? But well, we just passed it. We just passed it. <laughs> who was talking when we just passed it? Well, who do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so, I will take this then. Okay. okay. The, the way that you get 
expand your alternatives is, as John says, you land and you get fuel. Who in here would like to give me an idea of, for the people who run out of fuel on a cross-country trip, how close are they to their destination? Throw out some distances. Yes, sir. 10 miles. 20 miles. Very okay. close. The answer is very damn close. And <laughs> what I've heard generally is 25 miles. Mm -hmm. Within 25 miles. To, yeah, and, and, and a lot of them are that close. A lot of them are that close. So what's going on here? People aren't deliberately running themselves out of fuel. So I'm going to ask you a sucker question. How many people in here agree that general aviation fuel gauges are absolutely reliable and accurate? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't fall for it, John. <laughs> so when is the only time, according to the Federal Aviation Regulations, that fuel gauges are required to be accurate? When they're full? Isn't that handy when they're empty? <laughs> So the problem is you get close and, and and you look at those gauges bouncing off of empty and your brain says, that doesn't look so good. <laughs> and your gut says, I'm a pirate. <laughs> I can do this. I can make it there. After one of our talks, we had a couple here at Oshkosh a few years ago, we had uh, uh, the husband and wife come up to us and say, you've got to tell people that if you need, if there's any chance you're going to need a fuel stop, plan it when you plan your trip and put it halfway on the trip. They said, we planned a fuel stop 25 miles short of our destination airport. And when we got there, we thought we had enough fuel to keep going. No. And we didn't. And obviously they were still with us, but they were hurt pretty bad and they lost the airplane. So um, fuel is our lifeblood in aviation and we have to deal with reality. Deal with things as they are, not the way you planned them to be. Now, part of reality is the weather you're flying in. Who in here would like to give me the biggest cause of cross-country fatalities? What do you think? Fuel starvation. Fuel starvation is a good one, but it's continued VFR flying in worsening weather conditions. Uh, and so what we're talking about here uh, is and, and what we alluded to at the start of this talk, what is the key that's going to keep us alive? And the key that's going to keep us in life, alive is this R, the deal with care, the R in care, deal with things as they really are, not just as, they, as you plan them to be. So what you have to do is be willing to give up on a goal. You have to hardwire yourself to get to be willing to give up on a goal because the key to risk mitigation is as you're in, after you've gotten in the air you're just going to have to be willing to give up on a goal and that's that's martha and i are not very mature and that's hard for us uh, so, so but, but nobody takes off in, in vfr conditions or, or in weather conditions that they know are going to kill them you don't do that. What you do is you take off in reasonably good weather and things change. And what happened to John and I in the 210 where we, we took off with a perfectly functioning airplane at the beginning and things changed. We had a mechanical issue and we looked at it and we just, it was we went total into denial. denial of reality and we just kept right on going. So why do people go into denial? because they're goal-oriented people, because they want to complete what they set out to do. Because of these internal, external pressures, because of the same thing that let us all become pirates, the goal orientation, the motivation, the, the unwillingness to give up on a goal. So the key to our all surviving as pilots 
is this management of what's going on in between our ears. It's the management of our own uh, of goal-oriented behavior. So don't let those pressures make you do things that your brain is telling you that you really ought not to do. So here is a rule that you can use or, or a standard uh, to figure out whether or not you should do what you're thinking about doing. If you're getting ready to do something in an aircraft, ask yourself, would I do this if I had 100 paying passengers on board behind me? And if the answer is no, you wouldn't do it with 100 paying passengers on board, then why in the world would you ever do it with the, the most precious things in the world in, uh, behind you, or the people you care about, and your own life, and your own soul? And so the moral of the story is, don't take risks with just yourself or your family that you wouldn't do with a plane load full of passengers. If it's, if it's too risky to do with a whole bunch of people, it's too risky to do with you and the people you care about. Uh, here is the good news. Since we started teaching uh, as and an aviation... And testing on. What's that? And, and test testing on. Since we started doing, first of all, scenario-based training, and then started doing, doing the Airman Certification Standards and testing on risk management, the general aviation accident rate the fatal rate per 100,000 uh, hours is decreasing and it's got a noticeable inflection point in it. I hope we are continuing that. I hope that will stay. I hope it stays for this community and I hope it stays for all of us. And the moral of the story is we really have to start working on people and getting, getting them to be willing to give up on a goal. Uh, now we made some promises at the beginning and first of all was talk about the most important consideration in flying. No matter what happens, when you deal with things, you always need to make sure that you have what available to you? Alternatives. You always need to have alternatives, whether you need to change routes, stop and get fuel so you have more options, whatever it may be, you need to make sure that you always have alternatives. Well, Martha, that uh, pretty much wraps up. Well, our... you're not going to summarize PAVE and, and, and CARE? Well, I guess I am. <laughs> so, so PAVE stands for the pilot, the aircraft, the environment, <laughs> and the external pressures, and use it when you plan your trip to, to categorize and mitigate the risks. And once you're airborne, use C-CARE, which stands for the changes that are happening in all of those other categories of risk we looked at. What are the consequences of it? What do you need to do about alternatives? Make sure you deal with reality and control those external pressures. Well, Martha, that pretty much wraps up. No, we haven't finished yet either. Martha, you're getting on my nerves. <laughs> We haven't talked about the most feared emergency in all of uh, aviation. She's right. She's always right. Does anybody know what the most feared emergency in all of aviation is? Yeah. you got to well, pee. Well, if you're a rental <laughs> pilot, it's a runaway Hobbsmere. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we'd like to make a special wish for you. Keep the pointy end forward, the dirty side down, and by all means, please. Stay out of the trees. Thanks a lot. And thank you very much for coming. Okay. Anybody want to argue with something Martha might have said? <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> you have any questions? Anybody? Thank you for coming. Have a great time here at Air Venture.